Hi, everybody. It's John Reed with another edition of Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio. How you doing? Uh, it's a solo flight today, and you're probably asking, like, what the heck? Where's Where's John's guest? Is John John can't get a single person to come on a show? It's not true. Um, I actually spent the whole day uh, in career sessions with uh, students in my former college. So as a result, I didn't have anything lined up uh, as far as a guest. But what I am going to do today is I'm going to talk you through uh, the customer use case methodology that I use at Diginomica that I've used since we started eight years ago. And uh, you can pepper me with questions. And if someone's really persistent, uh, maybe I'll have you come up on cam and, and join me. So beware, you might get pulled on a cam. But uh, really, I wanted to talk to you about this because <clears throat> from a project perspective, um, avoiding project mistakes and achieving a result is is a pretty big deal. Um, I, don't, I don't care what discipline you talk about, whether it's BI or CRM or ERP, go out and do a search and you'll discover that the, the project failure rates are, are still very high for any of these technologies that are supposedly so important to our, tra to our digital transformations. So, uh, you know, and, and you can debate a little bit about the definition of failure that's used in these studies. And I've gotten into that a little bit in the past with a few analysts, but in general, uh, underwhelming outcomes all around. And so, so how do we avoid that? And through the course of hundreds of interviews on Diginomica, I've gotten a few feel for a little bit of that. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm this is gonna be a super long show, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the the top mistakes uh, that I see recurring again, and again on enterprise projects, and then also what I think are some of the keys to uh, a more successful project, including a few that hopefully are a little bit different than than the ones you might expect. Uh, and if you if you have your own uh, mistakes uh, that you see widespread, please feel free to put them into into the chat. <laughs> I probably won't get into uh, specific projects, uh, and I'm not going to get into the obvious whiffs like the the horrific uh, solar winds uh, security breach. Uh, that's happening as we speak, uh, the unfolding of that reporting. I, I want to look a little more at um, serious uh, enterprise projects that have taken place over time and and how they get stalled out or stagnated. So anyway, uh, as far as the top mistakes that, that I see on these projects, I think one of the biggest ones would be, and I'll, I guess I'll call this um, uh number five, but it could be number one. <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time prepping my countdown today, so you're going to have to bear with me on, on uh, five, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, they're probably all equal, but uh, the top one, which you really see on ERP products in particular is uh, over dependence on one prime vendor. So uh, again and again, when I run into projects that are stalled out or troubled, you find out that the, the customer is deep into it with a particular consulting partner that essentially has been dictating the the pace of the project and the priorities of the project for an overly long period of time without a whole lot of uh, accountability. And uh, if you look at uh, the, the most famous project failures in the history of <laughs> enterprise projects, man, the same, uh, the same names come up. I'm not going to use them. You, you guys all know the, the names I could throw out there. Um, and that doesn't mean these these top firms, these most famous firms, are all bad. It really depends on the nature of the the consultants on the project and if they actually keep the ones on the project that you interviewed and all that stuff. But over over dependence on a prime vendor is uh, is probably the biggest sticking point that I run into again and again on projects that, that fall short of the mark. Uh, customers, like it or not, have to take a certain level of ownership in. In, in their projects and they have to manage their their vendor relationships rather than letting vendors dictate outcomes. So that's that's a big one. So that's number four. Uh, and excuse me, number five. Num number four is uh, getting stuck in pilot purgatory. So a lot of times with these next gen projects that roll around, uh, you hear from a PR rep, oh, you know, this is, they, they've had this fantastic IoT project and blah, blah, blah. And you find out that it's actually a pilot it's taken place in one manufacturing plant, <clears throat> one shop floor, 
and it hasn't actually been extended or tested in any significant way beyond that. And the the problem, of course, is that it doesn't matter how how great your pilot is; it's it's just a pilot at that point. Um, we could make wallpaper out of the blockchain pilots that we've heard about, and and yet it hasn't really amounted to a credible gain. So, pilot purgatory is uh, is a, is a really really uh, big culprit, especially for next gen projects. And uh, now we have a comment from LinkedIn user who's a regular. Thanks for staying up late, LinkedIn user. By the way. I'll start easy. About 12 years ago, we were about to go live with an SAP upgrade. And a few days before, I, as the customer, very much just a business process analyst, asked about how the users would log in. It turned out they hadn't collected an actual list of users and spent the whole weekend gathering the data together. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, so that's um, that's a really big one. And I probably could have like had this on my on my top five list. Uh this is something that has really come to light uh, in cloud-based projects, which is there's been a much more increased emphasis on this notion of user adoption, and that's really because in the in the in the SaaS marketplace, if if users aren't actually using your software, um, then you're vulnerable essentially to a competitor who can come in and uh, sell to those same users. It's unused software is basically totally shelfware, and so. Adoption is everything, right? And so to the point of that comment, there was not nearly enough focus on, on user adoption. And, and perhaps they were looking at it from that narrow classic ERP vantage point of, well, let's make sure that the, that the super users are up to speed and the technical engineers are up to speed. But then at that point, like there's a business process analyst and yeah, they need to be engaged also. And in that case, they weren't. I mean, that that's such a blatant example that it's almost discouraging to read about such an unsophisticated example. Maybe you have a couple more that are even more current, because I'm afraid that even though that happened many years ago, that those those mistakes are repeating themselves. So, all right. So we'll call that we'll call number three on my countdown list of uh, lack of 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 user adoption, because that's that's really deeply pro problematic. Uh, okay. Um, Number two would be failure to quantify benefits of said project. So um, in many cases, uh, you'd be surprised companies go live and they, they have a so-called successful project. And when you sit down with them and ask them to quantify what they've actually gained from the project, they're unable to do so. Um, that's, that's a really a brutal situation to find yourself in. And it really doesn't, validate all the effort and expense that, that was made if you can't come up with some type of benchmark. And there's all kinds of ways of quantifying a project success. Uh, we could we could go back to those user adoption metrics. We could go back to certain kinds of, of, of cost efficiencies, perhaps uh, reducing legacy spaghetti, <laughs> uh, moving off of homegrown systems. You can measure that in terms of productivity. Ideally, you can take a look at automating workflows. Uh, I don't get too excited when the quantification is about simply headcount reduction. And I think one thing we have to be really careful about is sometimes when companies are able to quantify, like a PR rep will tell me, oh, don't worry, they have all kinds of quantifiable benefits. But then when you sit down with them, what you find out is that the only reason they could quantify all these benefits is because they were sitting on such a mess of uh, overgrown, homegrown systems and, you know, a hundred different instances of, of ERP running at the same time uh, that, that they, they almost couldn't help but gain some efficiencies when they, when, they, when they got rid of that morass. Or ultimately, if it's a smaller company, yeah, we were outgrowing our, our QuickBooks system or whatever, and we were operating off of spreadsheets. Well, of course, you, you can't run a business off of spreadsheets, um, so, uh, but, but those are really just the beginning of the quantifiable benefits to me. Um, a lot of the things I think you're really looking for are, uh, you know, aut automations. I mean, at the heart of it, no, no matter what type of project, whether it's BI or ERP or, or CX, I don't care what it is. It's about, um, uh, how much were you able to automate the mundane and how much were you able to free up 
your users for higher value so-called customer facing roles. And, and when I, when I, when I talk about customer facing, I, I'm using that definition very, very broadly. Um, to, I might even include certain employee groups in that, like where when IT talks about the business users as customers, then maybe, maybe, maybe that's your customer facing role. And certainly managing suppliers is, is a certain type of customer facing role also. So the, you know, when I'm, when I'm looking at projects, what I'm really trying to understand is, have you freed up your your users to 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 do do more strategic work and more impactful work? If if you just laid a bunch of people off as a result of that, then then that that's pretty underwhelming. Um, I think the uh, the number two thing, which is a uh, pretty easy one, is is sort of like tech infatuation. Um, someone pointed me today towards a uh, blockchain for manufacturers site. They were all excited about blockchain for manufacturers. This was on a, uh, okay, I'll go ahead and name it. <laughs> this was on a PwC site. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Cause it was in the context of a bunch of manufacturing trends, you know, just in time manufacturing and 3d printing and all these things that I think are having impact. And then blockchain, I was like, okay, well blockchain for manufacturers. Cause I don't know of a single live production instance of blockchain operating at scale. And scale is a, is kind of a cliched word, but in the enterprise world, when we evaluate projects, we're really looking at scale because maybe you just had one facility or, or one uh, business unit that went live on something. But if it can't scale to the rest of your users, then then it's freaking useless from the vantage point of of a true multinational enterprise project. So we're looking for scale. At Diginomica, we're always trying to figure out like, Yes, but did can this scale for you? And um, so anyway, I'm on this blockchain site over at PwC, and um, it was all about blockchain could and it could do this and it could do that. And when I serve as a judge on 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 panels judging um, software projects and stuff, which I do fairly frequently, that's really the biggest thing I'm looking for is like uh, when I see those verbs like could and will, and we plan to. It's like okay, well, you haven't really proven anything yet. And so that's, that's, that's number two on my list. Let's see your comment here. LinkedIn user. I didn't spend much time there, but I saw the systems architecture at a British er tobacco company. Good job keeping the name out. That's American interests. Back then they were migrating 200 SAP systems to the goal of five. Don't know how they got on with that. Again, that was like seven years ago. Right. So, you know, in, in the SAP world, for example, uh, SAP was able to get kind of a first wave of S4 HANA adoption partially from really, really complicated SAP environments that had become almost dysfunctional. And look, I mean, some sometimes that's not the customer's fault, right? Because maybe that could be the result of certain acquisitions and things like that. But the point is that, that that's, that's kind of like the so-called cliche alert. That's the low-hanging fruit. Um, when, when you can, uh, you know, clean up your landscape like that. And, and look, I mean, if that's enough to justify an upgrade, then, then that's a win. But uh, I, I wrote a, a couple of pieces on cloud ERP value realization, and I don't consider that the high end of value realization whatsoever. In fact, I should probably pull those pieces out in a second, go through a couple of them with you as I get to the things that I that I do look for in a project. I mean, I think if I had to pick, um, that I sort of have a tie in number one slot between two, I think I referred to one of them already, which is projects that aren't alive yet. It's amazing how much PR, uh, brouhaha you will see from products that aren't even live and vendors will go ahead and announce these. And sometimes they're just very excited that they got the win, especially if it's like against an arch rival. And so when, when you see the stuff in the press, and you think, oh, they're they're running the latest uh, ERP over at such and such uh, company. That's a big deal. Well, read a little more carefully, and you find out that it actually hasn't been installed yet. And so, there's not much of a proof point there, really. Um, and and that's just a PR stake in the ground. That that's not meaningful from a from a project success standpoint whatsoever. Um, so when we're when we're looking for proof points, we're looking for for companies that are 
engaged in genuine transformation efforts and and can speak to how their partnership with software companies are, are helping them to get there and, and the results that they're achieving. Um, and we're very frequently, we're looking for quick wins now as well. So we're becoming very, very impatient and skeptical about these multi-year products of the past because the problem is that the quick wins are really what build momentum and momentum is what keeps everyone engaged. And it also keeps leadership in place. Uh, these, these multi-year projects, one of the big dangers is that as, as they unfold, if you can't point to wins, then uh, eventually stakeholders get restless. The executive team gets restless and halfway through the CIO is out the door and they're reevaluating platforms again. Um, so, so quick wins is, is, is a big thing as far as on the win column is concerned. Um, the thing I really worry about the most is like employee morale and buy-in. Uh, I haven't really had this issue as much this year because uh, most of the e interviews I've done have been, you know, through the virtual video, right? Because that's that's pandem pandemic uh, living for you. Um, so, um, but when I actually like go out on the road um, and I'll make a point of doing the awkward uh, sit down at lunch with, with customers thing. And, uh, you know, at, at first, uh, when Diginomic was first starting, I kind of ate lunch by myself. Cause it was like, Oh, I got to regroup and I'm kind of shy about stuff. Maybe it doesn't seem like I'm shy. Cause I'm like on video talking by myself right now, but I'm actually kind of shy, shy in those settings. But, uh, but I eventually just said, you know what, I'm going to let everyone down. If I don't go sit my butt down next to these customers and, just strike up conversations. And it's amazing how many times you run into people who are just going through the motions on their projects and they feel very disengaged. And a lot of times when you scratch under the surface, they're kind of disillusioned. Um, they're disillusioned by the vendor promises and the hype from the keynote stage, but they're also kind of disillusioned with their own company and they, they're not bought into their company's mission and their company's priorities. And if, you, if your employees aren't bought in, if they don't believe in what you're doing, um, then I really don't see how um, a project can be successful, no matter how cutting edge or cloudy the technology is. And so employee morale is a really, really big thing for me. And um, it comes up a lot in the CX world that I travel in now frequently, because a lot of times when people talk about customer experience, these same companies that talk about customer experience, when you go in, look, go into some of these stores over the holidays, if you're, if you're willing to, and just see how disengaged and frustrated a lot of the employees are. Well, you know, is that good for your customer experience? Not at all. Well, it's not good for your transformation effort either. Um, a LinkedIn user has a comment here. One mistake is thinking that products can, can be implemented and then leave a support team, maybe a few good business people if they're lucky. That's absolutely true. I mean, there was a cliche a long time ago that I think was one of the first um, when you used to read these pieces in the, in the nineties about like how to do a successful ERP project back in the, in the heyday of the market. One of the, one of the biggest things was, you know, put your best people on the project. And, and, and that was always like a really important point. And it, it sounds like a cliche, right? Until you realize that a lot of your best people, especially back then had no interest in it. And, 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 and then you were afraid to do it because you didn't want them to get the skills and leave the company. So it ended up kind of falling to the, the, the uh, perhaps less talented employees or what have you. Um, <clears throat> now, I think fortunately with the impact of cloud and it, emphasis on customer lifetime value, there's a lot more of a focus on customer success and, and the vendor wants to be able to point towards a long-term success. And part of that is selfish. They want to be able to upgrade and sell more software and keep that, keep those revenue streams flowing. But yeah, they, they, you want to have your, your most talented um, people on a project. And, and, and a lot of times um, my, my late friend, Michael Doan, um, who unfortunately uh, died this year, was one of my mentors and heroes, um, RAP brother, uh, he, you know, his whole thing was like, go live is just the beginning. And that's what he would get so angry about, but he was a big one for business process improvement and, and business model transformation. And his point was that go live on these projects while it's important. It's, it's barely anything um, compared to 
the results you need to achieve afterwards. So if you just have a keep the lights on approach after go live, um, then you're not going to be able to really extract um, business value. Another LinkedIn comment. Another was not living up to continuous improvements of all parts of the reporting and user interfaces. Yeah, that's that's totally true. I mean, um, one of one of the project keys that also has um, become a little more widely um, embraced during the during the SaaS world is this notion of of, of user experience, right? Because you're not going to get user adoption without software that that users uh, can embrace and and easily use. Um, unfortunately, sometimes those interfaces can break over time. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. And, you know, adoption isn't going to happen without the type of user experience that a lot of classic software simply didn't have in the past. How do they get away with it? Well, because their software is primarily used by super users and there was very little emphasis, for example, on giving managers access on their mobile devices and things like that. But now, of course, all that stuff is very prevalent. Um, and, uh, and, and while we could have debates about agile methodology and you can expect me to continue to, to drill into agile principles on the show from time to time, the, this notion of continuous improvement, regardless of methodology is absolutely a, a core to successful projects today. Training is so important. Seeing lots of these AI ML bots that can talk to you now on annoying things like job applications, but the need to put these in a project rollouts of software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, this is another comment from LinkedIn user. And uh, I easily could have put lack of training, change management investment into the reasons why projects fail in, in many lists like this. If you're, if you're being honest, that's the number one reason why projects fail. And it, it's always very um, confusing when you realize that now we built up a repository of statistics showing that investing in training leads to better project results. And yet there's this continued resistance to doing that. And I think there's very, very specific reasons for that. Uh, again, um, you know, companies just have this sh sort of short term uh, mindset towards skills and talent. And a lot of times they, they don't invest in that long term. Uh, nurturance of employee relationship. I don't give a shit what they say about talent management. So often the emphasis uh, is on whatever skills you might have at any given time. And and the investment over time in, in your training and career growth is really overlooked. Um, and yet that's at the heart of a lot of these successful companies. You know, when you really dig into it, there's a center of excellence model that was actually pioneered by folks like my buddy, Michael Doan, uh, that applied to ERP, but have really expanded beyond ERP. And most companies that that have a philosophy of of software um, development in house and really look at centers of excellence rather than you know, I mean, there's certain cloud based software philosophies where you don't really have much internal IT or software skills at all. But for the most part, I'm an advocate of a center of excellence mindset and. And whatever it is, whether it's a BI center of excellence, and I've run into AI type center of excellence models emerging as well. Um, this is how you make sure that you're cultivating skills internally and not developing too much dependence on these prime vendors, as I discussed earlier in this discussion. Um, is there a role for AI ML in these projects? Absolutely. I mean, I think in many cases, uh, to pick on the ERP vendors again, they're not doing nearly a, a, as powerful a job as they could using. AI ML bot technology to help uh, customers assess the flaws in their landscape and the and the things that are going to break during during these software installations and upgrades. Um, so uh, you know it, it's it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition because on the one hand you're not investing enough in the human element with training and change management. On the other on the other hand, are you shortchanging some of the automation uh, tools? Whether you, whether I don't even care how smart or how AI they are. Um, are, are they are they uh, helping your users to do their jobs better? Um, so I think I've done a, a pretty good amount of my countdown of 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 of, of mistakes. Um, I also have a list of keys to successful projects. Um, and now we have Thomas chiming in. Uh, Thomas, good to see you. I'm looking forward to 
joining your 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 peeps next year. I think I'm booked the second week in January for your CRM show, so we're gonna have a good time. It'll probably be a lot more entertaining. To listen to me ramble on. Uh, for folks who are just joining, I'm doing countdowns of biggest enterprise project mistakes and also keys to successful project outcomes. Um, this is just a spontaneous thing because I didn't have time to line up a guest today. So here you go. Um, Thomas says, uh, isn't it that too many products do not have the interest needs of users at heart, but rather managerial needs interests? I think that's really true. I mean, Thomas, I, I can think of a couple of vendors offhand who have a reputation. They're supposed to, oh, they're, you just love their software. When you dig deeper, it's management that loves their software because management can track them, track track and monitor their productivity, and and kind of move them like move their users around like chess pieces on an, on a on a board. But when you dig into the user satisfaction levels, they can often be 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 very very low. The only thing I would say to counter your point, Thomas, is that I think in in the so called cloud software era, the danger there is that if if, if the users don't embrace the software, then essentially, even though you've bought software for those users, like the, you're vulnerable to the users either going rogue or developing their own tools or or perhaps insisting on using a different tool that they like better. So I think there has been some improvement there than if, if you go back 15 years, but but absolutely, those are very conflicting agendas. And um, in, in fact, I would go so far as to say that the best projects involve users from the very beginning uh, even before software selection to discuss the the transformation goals of the company and what, what they're trying to accomplish from a business perspective. And then um, getting into what that's going to mean for, for software and what that's going to mean for you, because obviously a big piece of this is that user users are going to have to change, right? Like, and, and look, change sucks. I mean, when I, when I log into Facebook to manage the group that I manage and they've, and they've done a massive user interface upgrade, I'm pissed off. Right. and, and that's a natural reaction. Like even if I grow to appreciate that it's a better interface. Now, in this case of Facebook, the interface absolutely sucks and it's not a better interface. It's a worse interface and all this stuff. But even if it were better, my first reaction is going to be like negative. And that's something that has to be overcome. And change management is probably even a nasty way of putting it because it implies that you're kind of manipulating users into changing you know, whereas I think of it more like getting people to buy in because they believe in what you're doing. They believe in your corporate mission. They believe in what you're trying to do in the market. They value their their role and their place on your team. From there, you can talk about software that meets their needs. Um, January 12th, it will be a blast. Yes, it will. It's going to be fun. So uh, if you guys aren't, aren't up for that yet, um, check it out on the calendar on Thomas's page. Um, and I'll make sure to post it as well. Um, I'm, it's going to be a CRM blowout. Um, we're going to talk about some really cool stuff with some very smart people on his show. Uh, let's see. I've got, wow, I got a bunch of comments. I'm sorry. I'm missing some of them. Ladio. Hey, hi from Tokyo. How you doing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like the, the history you can develop in this industry and how it's really a small world, even if we're spread out globally and stuff. And, that's one thing I like about this kind of video interaction is I think it brings people like back together who couldn't otherwise connect. So wishing you luck out there and stay in touch. I'm like a mentor for you. I, I just waffle my thoughts and I, John processes them and tells me whether it's a dumb idea or not. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm glad to do it, man. I mean, you know, I, I learned this also through through Diginomica is that we have to challenge each other. And I think one real key to successful projects uh, is the strength of the partnerships involved in, in achieving those those results. And I for my successful projects list, I, I apologize. I didn't have time to do like a formal like 10 to 1 countdown. So I'm going to rattle some of these off. And I'm not going to try to do the numbering thing. So I'm going to confuse myself. But um, but if I did pick number one, that would be it. Uh, it would be the strength of the partnerships because so companies, when they come to you with success, with products they claim that are successful, uh, when you peel back, if they really are successful, you will find breaking points. I don't care how good the project was. There were moments of crisis. There were moments where, where there were obstacles and delays and adversity. I mean, look at this year, right? And all the adversity that all of us have had to face in so many different aspects of our lives and our work lives as well. Um, and remote work 
was just the beginning of that in many cases. So, um, so, so when you look at that, what I want to hear about, I don't want to hear about how great everything went like that. That is such a drag and it's so disingenuous and at Diginomical with our partners, we're always talking with them about that. Like share your struggles, um, you know, sh share the hard parts with us, like, and, and share how your partnerships were tested. And invariably, like when I get a chance to interview, like for example, a customer, and sometimes I'll get a chance to interview the services partner or the same time. And you can tell the good ones because they're joking with each other. They're, they're even like teasing each other a little bit. They're, they're challenging each other. They're saying like, Hey, you charge me too much. Remember for that guy or whatever, like, but it's that frankness and that you can tell these folks are battle tested, right? I, I don't like to use like war metaphors to talk about enterprise projects, but you know, they're like, they've been through a lot together and you can tell that. And these, you know, in, in my use cases, I write for Diginomic. I always try to dig into those challenges and I won't write a use case if I can't find out what those challenges were. Cause that's everything is, is how you were tested and how you push through. I don't care. Even if it's, you made the right software choice, you have the right, um, sort of plan in mind for your long-term future for your company. Um, you got to have that piece in place. So, okay. Now we have many more comments. Um, Thomas. Yes. Best project start from the user. Bingo. Um, change management uh, literally means you need to change the management. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas, you already said it, get the users involved. Yeah. And Thomas, I would add to that, like, Across, across various business units. I mean, the the best products are breaking down the the silos. So, um, you know, it's something I, I ask vendors to do a lot more of. Is like, it's like, oh, we have this hackathon going on in our tech conference. It's like, well, where were your business users during the hackathon? Where were your designers? Like, why weren't they sitting at the same table talking through things? Because it's not just involving the users; it's involving the users across the dis the disciplinary scope of your project. I want your finance users talking to your developers. I want your HR team talking to your system admins. <laughs> I want everyone having back and forth about all the issues involved, especially when it comes to things like data, data privacy, data security. I want all those conversations to be happening because so often they come into conflict. And if you guys haven't been tracking the solar winds breach, it's, it's one of the most significant IT stories of the year. And, and it's a colossal illustration of all the, the flaws that, that still exist in the enterprise software ecosystem that we have to address or we're going to have these incidents happen again. LinkedIn user says, I love to work on a user-led project upwards bill. Yeah, it doesn't happen very much. Ah, we got Brian Summer. Best projects have a leader who has done sev several similar projects. They can hit off potential dead ends long before newbies will realize it. Absolutely. Hey, Brian, if you want to hop on cam, uh, just, uh, just let me know in the chat. I'll, I'll pop you a, a, a link to the, um, to the cam session. You can hop on for a bit. Brian says best projects have people that have spent time really learning what the desired end state is supposed to be and then build to it. Bad efforts keep getting distracted. I, I take you got to take Brian's input on this really, really serious. Brian, oh my God, Brian has seen more bad projects and more mediocre projects and you know more good projects than probably anyone in this whole field. So, Brian, if you're out there and you want to pop on cam, let me know. It is not only products but also implementation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I I like to see firms that services firms that have developed a methodology. I mean, one of the big mistakes that uh, the customers make that I could have put on my mistake list is they go with the big name service provider, the sexy service provider, or the one that's grandfathered in because they're already an approved vendor and they've been on other lists in the past, as opposed to looking for the partner that has the best methodology and the most experience in their industry. I mean, one positive change I would like to see in the market is much more focused on industry specific projects as opposed to, Oh, I'm doing a CX product. I'm doing an ERP project. Uh, Brian says, uh, put me on. All right. So Brian's going to, Brian's going to come on cam. So Brian, what I'm going to do, uh, I am going to, uh, find a link to this URL. 
and I'm going to copy it. And Brian, I'm going to send it through Twitter direct message right now. And uh, Thomas, I know it's late for you. Um, if you want to pop on for a few, just let me know. Um, and you can join in. I'll bring Brian in first. But Thomas, if you feel like hopping on cam, I know it's really late for you there. So you might be in your bunny slippers. Okay, Brian, I have just sent you the link. So here you go. Um, let me know if you have any problems getting in from that Twitter direct message. Sorry for delay there, folks. Uh, let's LinkedIn user says, um, Brian Summer agreed. I can't work out if people are good at explaining how things could be compared to what they have done. Um, <clears throat> All right, looks like Thomas is up for going on camp too. All right, Thomas, Thomas, give me like about um, 10 minutes um, and then I'll, I'll bring you on. I'm just going to bring Brian on first here. Brian, how we doing? Brian, I think I have a, I think I have an echo. So I'm going to grab my, um, grab my headphones real quick. Like about um, 10 minutes um, and then I'll, I'll bring you Right. If you have a, if you have two browser windows open, close your LinkedIn. Um, I did. Just keep, just keep. Okay. Cool. All right. Perfect. I'm gonna uh, plug in my headset. How we doing, man? It's cold here in Carmel, <laughs> and uh, anyway, you missed a hell of a call earlier today. I had a, an old uh, Anderson buddy of mine. He's over at KPMG. He called me up to replay every old software industry joke I used to tell 20 years ago. I oh, forgot. Geez. I'd forgotten some of my better ones back then, but anyway, that's another day for another time and another call. But anyway, you want to talk projects today? Yeah. I mean, I'm going through kind of, I went through a bunch of project mistakes and now I've kind of been leading into successful project uh, scenarios, but I'm, I'm happy to hit on you on a couple of your top uh, mistakes as well. If, if you'd like to hit on them, I, some of the mistakes I hit on were things like pilot purgatory over dependence on a prime vendor, uh, tech infatuation, lack of employee buy-in, uh, inability to quantify benefits, focusing only on cost as a benefit. Those are some of the things I've been hitting on is like, um, but, but the thing I keep coming back to is like, when I go to, when I go to an event and I sit around a bunch of customers and they all seem disinterested, that scares me. <laughs> that, that scares me. Um, yeah, you and I and Ray Wong and others, we, we love the play to the game of sandbag a, a table full of oh, customers yeah. at a user conference. And it's fascinating how much they'll, um, they'll spill. And we hear stories about integrators. We hear stories about the vendor, the products and everything else. And so what if you, what if you had to pick your, your, your top three product mistakes that lead to bad outcomes right now? Like what, what are the three that just come to mind at in the moment? The one that just flashing in front of my mind is I had a, uh, I would say is not building in enough flexibility. And here's why. I've seen, uh, I was in the middle of a giant global shared service project once when overnight the company decided they were going to sell 40% of the firm. And it just kind of blew the whole economics of the deal, you know, right down the, the tubes. Uh, I was in another one where we had the opposite problem, where we were in the middle of a giant implementation and the company bought another firm that was bigger than it. And, uh, you know, that kind of put a, the kibosh on the effort. Oh, but, that'll do it. Uh, some of the things that are really kind of amazing to me, um, I'm going to go back to the people because I, I really think the people are probably one of the biggest things going. Uh, I've seen tremendous amounts of like resume fraud. I'll never forget one, one time in 2000, I want to say it was about eight. Uh, Workday was only three years old at the time, but a resume came across my desk of somebody who claimed to have 14 years of experience implementing Workday uh, HR. Um, you know, when I run into that kind of resume fraud, I just really want to go haul those people out into a field and dispatch them with a single shot, you know, I mean, you know, because they screw the whole industry. They hurt everybody, you know, when they get out there and misrepresent themselves so, so much. So um, a good friend of mine uh, has been a CIO in many, 
roles, and he's brilliant technically, and he does one great best practice. He interviews the daylights out of people before he puts them on a project team, because if you're holding yourself out as a product expert or a technical expert on something, you better be able to defend that and prove it, because he doesn't want to waste spending a bunch of money on you um, if you don't know anything. Uh, and related to that, having spent a long career in in the, uh, the big SI world, it's okay for people to cut their teeth and learn as they go. But there's got to be full disclosure on that. You need to have them buddied up with people who actually know this stuff so that there is a way for knowledge to actually get transferred. If you're expecting a pile of newbies, uh, you know, it comes piling off the school bus with just some basic rudimentary training or somehow are going to become valuable contributors with no one to apprentice or help them, it's going to fail pretty quick. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Thomas, uh, I just sent you a, a live link to the back end to come on cam i sent it to you via linkedin message so uh feel free to pop on um yeah and i'll just run through a couple others that that i look for you know in, in my discussions when i talk with customers one of them is i'm looking for i talked about quick wins before i'm also looking for kind of that platform mindset so in other words if you built a really cool app um that that helps you uh you know, like, let's say it's a digital commerce app. Like, I want to know how it fits into your data platform. If it doesn't fit into your overall platform so that you can analyze and report on that information and then build three more apps that are going to serve similar purposes, I'm not as impressed. So the, these one-off projects don't make a lot of sense to me anymore. There has to be some overarching vision of your technology platform. Um no disagreement and uh, uh, tangential to that point. Oh, there we go, Thomas. Hi, how are you? Hey, uh, Thomas, welcome. Yeah, thanks you, for putting me in. Yeah, you were you were deserving of your own prime time spot, but but we're just doing the half ass thing today. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but w welcome to the show. Someday I'll probably just have you on by yourself to shoot the ship, but. For now, welcome to our project failures and successes discussion. Yeah. So, John, real quick, uh, I work. I did a bunch of work with one CIO, and I don't recommend this for anyone else. This guy wanted to be have bragging rights. He wanted to be the first to run with a new mainframe operating system, the first to implement this software package, uh, the first to use this new uh, database technology and, um, and, 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 and. He had so many technical first involved in there. We couldn't get anything to even compile cleanly for months. And, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place to do some of that kind of, you know, cutting edge innovation. But for God's sakes, not when you're trying to put in a financial system. I mean, you he, know, was, and, uh, he was positioning for his supernova award. Yes. Um, Yes. And uh, you, you, can't, you can't do that, man. You, you can't do that. That's and again, a time and a place. And that project was not where you really wanted to be on the, you know, on the super bleeding edge. Um, all, right, all right. So, uh, so Thomas, uh, tell us your, your top three project mistakes that are top of your, your mind tonight. What, what are the top three? Yeah, well, one we already had, yeah. I'm the gonna... user. Lack of user, lack of user, lack of user engagement, right? Yeah. The, the the user is not the guy who buys the system, and the one who buys the system doesn't always have the interests at heart of who's actually using it. You know, this is part one. Part two is that very often, at least, yeah, very often one can say clients are not um, consulted. Yeah. So we, we implement as well. They, they do not yet know what they want, yet mm -hmm. they buy a software and throw it at a problem that they may or may not have. I just yesterday I had a discussion with one, so he insisted in actually against the <laughs> soft advice of the vendor to go for a piece of software, which is probably not solving his problem. Anyway, so this is second one. Third one, change management we already had. 
-hmm. and fourth is go going on in long installments instead of taking a an approach of failing fast or better not failing fast delivering value fast yeah, so go go on in small incre increments that deliver value to the company because value gets delivered only in using it not by mm -hmm. putting an end on the project so see it use it learn from it next iteration yep this doesn't happen yeah well with that i already gave you the three solutions to the problems <laughs> excellent now successful products can can hereby commence but brian do you run into that too where uh, thomas's first one that he mentioned there about you know uh a, a customer latching on to technology that will kind of save them from themselves even though it, they haven't really done a requirements analysis that it really meets their needs um yeah i see people buy they buy a lot of packages frankly before they even know what they really want and they get bad advice from vendors vendors are like oh just go ahead and you know we'll add these other modules on there whether they fit your industry your business or anything else and then you got the client later on trying to figure out you know how do we put a size 13 foot into a size six shoe and it's just not going to work and uh and they're going but we already paid for it yeah but it doesn't fit your business you know and the users hate it and everything else Probably one of the bigger fights, I see that all the time. Uh, a lot of HR departments never want to go with the HR system from like a manufacturer's ERP product uh, because it uh, it's about as user friendly, you know, as a um, as a steam engine is today for transportation. It just, you know, they're they're industrial products and they're they don't really speak to the kind of uh, UX, I guess, that a lot of people want. And anyway, but yeah, I see that. I've seen, definitely seen that. I will say this. One thing I did in a regulatory environment, I wanted to make sure this is a, one thing to ensure success, a, a positive tip. Knowing how complicated the rules and regs were, I, while I was very confident that our team had done a great job of designing uh, and getting all the code right to reflect what the law stated, I offered 2,700 users the opportunity to win a really nice bonus if they could find an error in our system before it went live. And that's because I knew that the economic cost of if we got it wrong, it was going to cost the company gazillions and bad press and everything else for not being in compliance with the, with the regs. And uh, it was like, 500 bucks i mean it, not a huge amount of money but it was amazing it got 2700 users so energized they were just beating the daylights out of the beta system trying to find uh, i wonder if they know about this one particular deal that we have to deal with in five parishes in louisiana and they're and they're just beating it up and the good news was they found like two of them and I had no problem at all with that because they found two little deals where some of this like nested if then logic, we had to reverse two lines around to get it to get it correct. But so what if it costs like a, a thousand bucks in total? It saved the company bazillions. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. I just throw that out there. It was an odd case, but it's one of them where making incenting the users or the super users to get involved to beat this stuff up that's a good thing it yeah. really is yeah. and the other good thing was looking hard at it beforehand that's what the team did, yeah? so they worked mm -hmm. hard before they did the implementation yes we did all that that was user acceptance yeah. and you know yeah. and this, this is often something that happens as well so what gets cut out out of an offer of a of an implementation of an SI. First thing is they look hard at any buffers, which might be project management, for example, mm -hmm. which might be topics like, if made explicit, like designing things, like interviewing users, like wireframing it. So that is so fast and easily cut out of an offer as being not really necessary that at the end of the day, you arrive at guesswork when you do it mm. and the result then often is that either you get a raft of change requests 
which raise the cost of the project inordinately, or you get something that doesn't make anyone happy. Mm. And Thomas is actually, he, he, that last sentence is very important because I guarantee you there isn't a system anybody designs that ever ends up looking quite like the way they thought it was going to look. Yeah. And when you're done, then there is there can be some battles about, you know, people are like, uh, I don't like this or whatever. And, I, and, and it's a real balancing act to come up with a design that, does the job and does it, I'm going to say, well enough that people find it quite usable and everything else. But we're not trying to build, you know, a um, uh, like a Vermeer painting, you know, that's going to last for, you know, hundreds of years yeah. and inspire us uh, all that time. I mean, I think back about some of the systems I, I was responsible for building. And I had one that went in in 1980. Five, it went live, and it got re completely rewritten uh, in ooh, about 90, no, excuse me, in uh, 2005. And I found out uh, one, the, uh, one of the execs actually called me up because my name is still in all of the pseudo design stuff mm -hmm. and everything else all these years later. He called me up and was telling me about it. He says, you know, we basically used the same stuff that you had, all the, the um, pseudocode for all the regulatory things. This is another one of those regulatory ones. We just uh, updated it to run in the cloud now. And I'm like, okay. And uh, I was flattered that it survived that long, but most of these systems don't last. And they really don't make it that long. We got a couple of comments. Uh, the bounty hunter carrot idea is genius. Uh so there, there you go. You got some props for that. <laughs> uh, what is going to what is going to be the new successful way of making project work going forward? So sick of agile phrases. Surely no one does waterfall anymore. What's the new buzzword and thoughts around building SaaS type products along with ERP and BI solutions? One comment I'll make to that is, in in general, what I'm looking for is is quick wins and so-called continuous improvement. So if you can handle those buzzwords, those are the things I'm really looking for. I, I think maybe there's a third thing, which is just pure grit. I mean, I think these things are hard and, and I, don't, I don't think that, any, that that ever goes away. And so I, I, I look for that kind of character of, of very, very committed individuals. Um, but of course that, you know, that's kind of boilerplate. That doesn't go for every single project, but you know, you can still do these large multinational projects, but I just think that in this environment, like if you can't chunk out victories along the way, it's just never going to get done. And then you're going to have a political regime change and then you're going to start from scratch again. Yeah. I, I call it think big, act small. You know, that's the, there you the, go. the same approach. Yeah. There's the <laughs> phrase that pays for today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> think big, act small. <laughs> <No>. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And the, I mean, the SaaS products as well as any th shrink wrap products, as they were in the good old on premise side times, yeah. they, they have a user interface. They simply have it. They support processes to some extent or another. Yeah. And w what's the goal of implementing them if you do not do custom development, if you want to avoid it? The goal is support a business process, achieve a business objective. Now, the process may change by implementing the software. One of the worst mistakes you can do is throw away your current one, implement a new one, and ha have it built exactly the way you did it before. It won't work. So what needs to happen is that the users know what the objective of the process is, that management knows what the objective of the process is, and that there is a reasonable process designed in between. That's called, mm. well, it's user story mapping, journey mapping, however you want to call it with buzzwords. Yeah. That is there for ages. It just doesn't get done. And it works with SaaS software as well. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to take Thomas's point. I'm going to build, I'm going to move it up to the the intergalactic level. Um, <laughs> and, no, no I, I don't disagree with what you got. Uh, I think what happens a lot of times in technology circles is people get so 
uh, narrowly focused around it, like a specific project or initiative uh, that we need to come back and and I would encourage your listeners to think about where do I take my career going forward? And like right now, as of about an hour ago, I just get signed off and got the client sign off on a new giant project that involves, among other things, a factory of the future. The problem here is someone has to start diagramming out. And I've already been working on this is how we're going to flow information like the digital fingerprint. How is that going to move from crops and fields all the way through rail cars and it makes it through staging warehouses, through processing facilities, onto trucks, and then all the way to, you know down the rest through of the, the Through the power of edge computing, Brian. Come hmm. on, man. <sighs> okay. The person who wrote the question to you was very clear. They don't want to hear all those buzzwords, John. Oh, man. What I'm getting at, though, is we need people. The industry definitely needs people who can step back and see the big picture and understand what are the major kinds of data elements in the modern age that we need to move and how we're going to move them and where they're going to go and where do they get staged. Yes, yeah, some of them will be at the edge. Some will be in a data ocean. Some of it are going to eventually end up in like an ERP or they're going to be in dashboards and analytic apps and on and on and on. Uh, some need to get pushed into some kind of anomaly detection technology. But we need to know where, what is that information in general, where it's going to go. And from that, you'll come up with dozens or hundreds of projects that have to take place because the world doesn't begin and end in a frigging ERP system. There's a whole lot of other information out there. And one of the things I learned a long time ago was uh, you talk to some of the younger uh, college grads and they think that all you need to do to build an app is to create the little bit of code that ends up on a smartphone when no one's thinking about where does that data go after that smartphone app you know into uh, how does it get into all the different uh, accounting systems the inventory systems how does it fit into an omni channel you know retail app and all this other kind of stuff and how does it eventually generate an invoice bill or whatever and it's all that other back end stuff that is really tough to figure out. And we need people that know that, not just the basic skill of once we've broken it down and decomposed the big effort into an, a discrete project, that's good that we have people that can do that. But that's not the only skill set that we need right now. And with all the change going on in commerce and technology and, the, and all the movement around the digital stuff today, we definitely need more of these super architects who can figure this stuff out. Anyway, so, sorry for the impassioned point there, but uh, <laughs> I'll give you my number if you need some help on your project. <laughs> uh, okay, send it on, Tom. Send it on. A lot, a lot of heavy lifting in the factory of the future, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can, I can help shovel coal if you need. <laughs> well, we're 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 moving to a more low carbon kind of footprint on, not just on the project too. <laughs> understood, but, uh, understood, understood. <laughs> Yeah, I had um, a, a couple years ago, I, I attempted to chart out uh, a kind of a progression of value realization. It was, it was primarily focused on cloud ERP. Um, but one of the reasons I did that is because I was frustrated that, that, that so many companies were patting themselves on the back by just what I called the immediate gains of consolidating disparate systems on a user-friendly platform which um, look, a lot of these modern cloud platforms are fairly user-friendly now. Now, granted in a large enterprise, you, you, you know, you can't talk about consolidating everything onto one platform necessarily. So this was, you know, cloud ERP in more mid-market settings. But I was getting frustrated because the way I, the way I put it in the article and I broke down all these different stages and, and I got into, Brian, some of your points around external data, but my point was, too many companies just pat themselves on the back and call that a successful project when in my opinion that's just the beginning and the the second thing i talked about was increased decision support and data visibility um, in real time um, which of course is like now you have a project but where is your data where what what kinds of decisions are you making based on that data um how how so-called intelligent is that and then and then and then beyond that achieving new business opportunities through that platform business model changes based on that data and 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 
of all the hundred hundreds of customers I've interviewed, so few of them achieved any kind of business model transformation. And yet the vendors were trotting out these use cases in state of the art. And I was like, well, just because you moved off QuickBooks and Excel doesn't mean you're kicking ass in your industry. Okay, so you're right. And let me pile on on there, if I may. I think anyone who works on a project and at the end of the project, all you can say is that you didn't improve the ROI or you didn't add uh, economic value to the company at the end of the project. Uh, you got to ask yourself, why did I do this? Uh, you know, if you know, why why are we involved in this kind of an effort that doesn't move the needle? It costs money and it doesn't return any. It's a waste of shareholder capital, and it's an embarrassment to the industry. In fact, anybody, any of these vendors, and I know wh where you're coming from on this, John. It it crispy fries me to listen to a vendor want to preach to me about how great their new technology is, and it and all it is is they're they're making some minor adjustment to an old product and they want us to install it now for the fifth or sixth time. And, um, and all the benefits came the first time it was automated and not the fifth or sixth iteration of it. Uh, it, you know, everyone should be asking the question, where is the value? I mean, there should be an extraordinarily clear business case because if I'm running a project, I want to know how are we going to achieve those kind of metrics? It's not just did we get it done on time and under budget, but what did we do to help the business? And that's the part of the conversation I think that um, some IT shops sometimes get so enamored with, hey, there's a new release or a new version of a product or it can be replatformed. And my question always is, so what? What is it going to do to the bottom line of the company? And how does it how does it fundamentally grow top line revenue, re, you know, improve um, profits and enhance market share? What is it going to do? And when I get those, but Brian, you don't understand, it's a new platform. And I go, and, you know, and, and I still can't get an answer, you know, because and they don't have them because the value, the business case is so fundamentally weak. And that that chaps me off. Dan Hallett is asking about digital twins, which may tie back a little bit to your factory of the future conversation. Is there a role there? Yeah, uh, we're going to probably model something along those lines uh, to kind of see how it's going to flow first before we put all the money into the reprogramming PLCs and setting up the MES and everything else that's part of what goes in there. But yeah, there's a role for that. No question about it. And to Dennis's point, there should be something, we should be thinking along those lines in a lot of other contexts other than just a factory of the future kind of deal. We should be, we should have a digital twin for e-commerce and Talk about a failure. I called a company. I ordered a product on Cyber Monday, and it said I should have it in four to seven days. So I called their help desk about um, customer support line probably five days ago at the first this week, and I got a recorded message saying, well, we're having trouble with our shippers, so your order may be delayed seven to 12 days. Well, now I'm 19 days late, and I called, and I finally get a real person, I go, Oh, yeah, yeah. It looks like they tried to fulfill your order three times already, and we just don't have the inventory. I'm like, when's, when were you going to tell me about it, you know? And, um, uh, and clearly, they don't have a digital twin in their e-commerce system, and my feeling about um, – and they don't have anomaly detection, and they don't have a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, they can take the order, and I'm – paraphrasing Jerry Seinfeld here on that great rental car uh, episode. They just don't know what to do with the order. And, um, you know, that's where we need more technologies like a digital twin. Well, and the worst part is that you, you, you as Santa Claus takes the hit. You're the one that, that has the image problem for not having yeah. your shit together mm -hmm. around, around the holidays. So you get exposed and it's not your fault. So since Dan's listening in, I'll say, uh, I agree, Dan. Absolutely. And um, uh, since Dan and John are on Diginomica, I'll have you guys know I did write a, or write a piece that incorporates a software company CEO's letter to Santa. 
and I sent it to John to see if he'll review it tonight. But uh, oh, maybe that great. that may be forthcoming. But um, that one will push uh, Santa into the snark uh, territory pretty quick. Jeez, yeah. Well, that's something for me to look forward to for a little bedtime reading. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> it's a short one, but anyway. Mm. Uh, sorry, I, I sorry, I took us down such a, uh, an odd rat hole. We were talking great about projects, and then yeah. somehow we got on to Santa Claus. And anyway, uh, well, anyhow. an annual project, a, re a repeating one that has a lot to do with inventory, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you say that. Uh, there's something in there. I remember writing about how Santa had outsourced all of his uh, supply chain work uh, or his production work to uh, the North Pole. Anyway, there's a mention about that somewhere in that letter. Anyway. <laughs> Looking forward to, to reading that one <laughs> on Diginomica next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we definitely are good at deconstructing the, the logistical problems facing Santa Claus during these difficult times. Uh, yeah, yes, we, it's time for Santa 2.0, you know. When, and, um, are reindeers affected by COVID? Mm. Yeah. Uh, good question, uh, Thomas. I'm sure the internet has the answer to that. Um, <laughs> well, let, let me Google it. Yeah. <laughs> One second. <laughs> so, so, Thomas, tell us a little bit about your, your show that I'm going to appear on. What's, uh, what's the inspiration behind your, your video show? Would be that's that's actually simple. Um, CRM players was the original in, in inspiration. They are very good and very famous on the US side. By the way, to your comment, it might be late for me. It's right now. It's quarter past three in the afternoon. So not that late. <laughs> uh, not that late, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they are very good in and very known and have their audience in the US. And if Ralph, a friend of mine, and I had the feeling that this could and should be extended to Europe. And that's why we just plunged into it with little to no preparation. Meanwhile, I even got a better microphone. So with little to no preparation, called a few friends and then got, got a little bolder, called old friends, more or less famous industry people like you, who <laughs> <laughs> agreed to appear and that we are going. Excellent. And rolling. It's, it's, it's fun. Every, uh, every Tuesday, is that right? Every Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. CET. Cool. So, and we intend to go through the Christmas period as well. Need to plug this 29th of December hole. Worst case, nice. we, we do a run, a, do a run alone. Well, feel free to post a link in the in the chat if you'd like. That's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So we have. Um, uh, I'm sick of inventory implementation problems, says LinkedIn user. He has a great example of how a leading stationary company implemented SAP ended up mixing up the unit of measurement. So rather than one box of 1,500 tea bags, they received one tea, tea bag. And then on one pack of 200 sheets of paper, the customer received 200 pallets of paper <laughs> delivered via three delivery trucks to a random address in Scotland. <laughs> that, that's absolutely brilliant. Oh, there's, some, there's a QA person that's not going to last very long. Um, no. Hey, I, uh, you know, I'll tell you this, John, I, I once was, uh, I did a lot of quality assurance work on uh, big uh, projects in my Accenture days. And I was doing one in uh, France and uh, it was a big PeopleSoft implementation. And I showed up crack of dawn to start diving into all the project paperwork and everything else and a uh, meeting with the clients, mostly through all morning long. I'm trying to find out, you know, how they see the project and what are the challenges, all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, somewhere around lunchtime, one of them, um, one, a, um, a German uh, senior on the project comes up to me and is kind of whispering to me and tells me that all the French staff are furious with me 
And I go, why? I haven't even had a chance to talk to them yet. And they go, well, that's it. See, you're because you don't drink. I mean, you don't drink coffee and you don't smoke. They can't meet with you outside with a cigarette or by the cappuccino machine to tell you what's really going on on the project. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't believe this. You know, um, I failed a cultural test here uh, by not by not smoking or drinking coffee. Of course, I do drink Dr. Pepper, but, uh, you know, they didn't have that at the client. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I point that out because what makes a success sometimes and how you detect whether something's going right or wrong, uh, I guess, has to factor in, what, I guess, the degree of candor that people are willing to share on under what circumstances. And you really need to have that kind of open communication. And it's kind of hard for somebody just to parachute in for a day and figure that out unless you've been tipped off to what's going on. Uh, anyway. That's yeah, and I actually have a couple of additional... Getting back to the reindeer. Sorry if I interrupt. So oh, go ahead. we came back, <laughs> reindeers are most affected next to dolphins. <laughs> However, really? you almost got, got there, but <laughs> that's what they say. All right. Well, uh, Godspeed to the reindeers during this yeah. trying during this trying time. Yeah. And and hopefully the vaccinations will be arriving shortly. We're there. Uh, Mission critical. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, hey, Den. If you're still listening out there, uh, in the earlier portion, we we went through our uh, top reasons that projects go to shit. Um, if you have a couple you want to put in the chat, that'd be great from your experience what are the top reasons that projects go belly up or, or underperform in various ways um i wanted to mention a couple um what i feel are underrated keys to project success that aren't discussed very frequently um one that i that i look for is uh, active user group involvement um and and it's not just necessarily user groups per se because obviously some software uh companies don't have very well-developed user groups, but it's that tenants, that willingness and tendency to come up for air. And, and, the, and if the culture of your organization encourages users to do that and doesn't penalize them for time they spend developing networks that can help them and, and connecting and learning and sending people, investing and sending people to conferences and educational programs and such, I think that's really an underrated component in the the companies I see that that encourage that behavior in users have happier users and more informed users who can come back from those shows and say, "Hey, we configured this wrong, and the, you know we need to change this, or we need to take a look at this roadmap because there's a change in the product." Or, "Shit, I heard a rumor that this company's getting acquired in three months. We might be fucked." Like those are the things you learn at shows that you don't get at sitting at home. I'll plus one that all over the place. I, I had to implement a package once that had more bugs than a than a, than a than a than a jungle. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, and meeting all these customers at uh, a user conference, I wrote down every name, phone number. I I got every business card I could, and I was on the phone with them. Uh, uh, frequently throughout that project, I was constantly emailing and phoning them, trying to find out how they got past some of the problems that were in that package. And um, and one caveat I would say is you got to be prepared to play the quid pro quo thing too. You've got to have something to offer up as well. You need to you need to make some of your best and brightest available to some of these other companies to help them solve their problems. And at one point, I remember I even had to get on a plane and I flew to Minneapolis to a giant company there because they just could not get the uh, source code to install. And I got there and it didn't take me one minute to diagnose the problem, but we couldn't figure that out remotely until I saw what was actually happening there. And then once I got it done, uh, I was back on a plane that, you know, that afternoon and that that company just was thrilled to actually have the system operational, uh, but 
getting access to those people is killer. And I agree with you, John. In fact, it's interesting. Some of those people actually get some benefit actually talking to in industry analysts um, just to find out, like, what else am I missing here? Because uh, we'll have those other stories like the M&A stuff or the private equity insights or whatever that are right. going on in the background mm -hmm. that put the real uh, cherry on the cake uh, or cherry on the sundae, so to speak. Yeah, who knows where Brian's summer anecdote might lead to a project payoff for you uh, when you come back home. Uh, all right, we got we got Den Dancer guys to uh, to project project failure. Uh, he he uh, had trouble boiling it down to three, but he's given us three here. Uh, BS business case sold the C suite, then dumped on a dumped on the IT. There you go. Uh, focus on TCO, not ROI. We've discussed that a fair amount today. Yeah. And and three solving the wrong problem, so yeah, that too. <laughs> good, yeah. very good. L luckily, we are not not too far off. No, it's a similar ballpark to what we've been discussing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark is always a, a funny one. How, What's that? You, the business case is always a funny one because they are often politically driven. That's just one case, right? Now, well, the BC business case probably was the same for both software ven vendors in question. Mm. At the end of, the, and they had a landscape that mainly consisted of one of the two. They chose for this particular implementation the other one, which one now could say from the outside is because all of the wrong reasons, because it won't really fit into the landscape. The BC will not hold up, I think, although they calculated them the same. And the whole thing was driven by a few people who desperately wanted this one vendor. So it's pure politics. Mm -hmm. And that, that will bite them in a few years. And it will bite hard. So I'm always the outside guy on projects, and uh, I'm not. Obviously, I don't have a. I don't work for the company, um, and I'll see those. To your point, Thomas, I'll see those politically driven business cases. I'll see like an IT shop build a business case for doing something on premise, you know, right up to the coronavirus, and I know the numbers are are missing they're missing huge chunks of expense categories or capital categories because they want to make the numbers work for them so by eliminating things you're trying to do that i mean i go on and on but you're right the the politics of the business case are incredible but what's fascinating to me is how many times i get uh, asked to come up and talk to the uh, cfo or the ceo of a client and and one of the things someone asked me is is this um is this business case? Is it? Uh, is it? Are, is somebody on drugs here, or what am I missing? And you know, I learned a long time ago. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the truth, and sometimes that may cost me a project. Uh, but I'm gonna tell the truth because I have my own reputation to protect. But at the same time, I, I generally will tell the uh, the unvarnished truth. Uh, I'm gonna tell it to the highest ranking person there, including the CEO. And sometimes, you know, if I got a client that lies and misleads before the project even gets kicked off, you can imagine the kind of stunts they're gonna pull throughout the effort. So we need to get, you know, we need to get the thing on a good ethical and, you know, and financial yeah, kind of foundation, or, you know, you're just trying to build something on quicksand and it's gonna come back and bite you. Well, I'm glad you brought that up for two reasons. One is because I think too often in our industry, consultant is actually defined as as basically telling the client what they want to hear and delivering on the client's uh, beck and call. And and in yeah. fact, the true consultant is a truth teller, and 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 is expert in such a way that you are calling BS. And when I when I went back in the beginning and talked about the the problem of overdependence on a prime vendor. It's exactly this why I started a series on Diginomica a number of years ago on why independent experts and advisors matter to, to these projects because, and Brian, you're actually in the series. I'll post a link to it. Um, but, um, but basically because I think uh, companies need to hear uh, some type of sort of, I guess you could call it an audited or an expert viewpoint from someone that doesn't have such a big stake in 
in, in nursing at the nip of the, uh, the cow there. Yeah, the definition of a professional, I know I've written about this before, is someone who puts their client's interest ahead of their own. And we think about that often with, uh, you know, about that's what an attorney is supposed to be. They're supposed to be a zealous advocate for their client. That's what a physician should be. And the question, you know, what you're heading up here, John, is there, I think there's a difference between a consultant and an integrator, uh, right. you know, and or a reseller. They all have different allegiances and the consultant, if they really are a consultant, should put their client's interest ahead of their own. If a consultant is selling a solution, then they're not a consultant. And and that may be that may bother some of your listeners here, but that's the real deal is are you who are you trying to serve yourself, your firm, your employer, or your client. And if you're not serving the client, uh, then be honest about, you know, what your, what your position really is here. I, I, I never wanted to be, I, I'll, I'll put this out there. I never wanted to be a system. I never wanted to be a bag carrying representative of a product or solution. I'll mm-hmm. implement things. But I always, I've always been client number one focus first, and I will do what's right for the client. Now, I don't mean this as an infomercial for me. I'm just telling you that, and that's why I have a reputation. And I know sometimes I can be come off as a hard piece of cheese here, but um, I am going to be a straight talking kind of guy. And you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you the, tell you the way it really is. Hey, at least you're not a moldy piece of cheese, so that's something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank it, you. Th- hearing you talk, it's hard to believe you ever worked for Accenture, man. It's amazing. Oh, oh well. <laughs> oh. But, uh, you know, sounds it's interesting, like, Brian. Like oh, sorry, what's that, Thomas? That sounds more like the colleagues at KPMG. <laughs> Whoops. Uh-oh. Okay. All right. Like, I don't know if we can go there. But um, actually, Brian, it's kind of interesting when you bring that up because – when I when I go on my little independent advisor stump speech, um, the, the the pushback I get is that oh it's too difficult to manage the politics of that like like it, it introduces another element and I'm like well that's part of a customer customer ownership of the project the politics were there anyway um, politics are all over customer sites so that's a terrible excuse. Um. You know, I, I've got a buddy at one of the major firms, and he is responsible for delivering over $100 million a year in revenue from that one account. And I can't imagine the kind of stress he must have trying to always deliver that because I know that in the life cycle of watching my clients, I have clients who call me up with a whole bunch of stuff that they need done this year and maybe a little bit in the next year and then the third year it may trail off quite a bit but that's because their business has ebbs and flows and everything else how could someone legitimately always deliver a steady like a hundred plus million a year in you know client revenue out of a single account is kind of mind-boggling to think about that but they got to be doing some things that um may not always necessarily be in the client's best interest uh, in that immediate time frame. I'm not saying that's the case, but it, but I just real, I know that we go through economic cycles and, and if that guy is still trying to get that this year in 2020 out of that account, uh, then either that was one well-protected industry that wasn't affected by the coronavirus or they're doing something interesting to get that kind of revenue out of that account. Government. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, the, in general, what what I've seen with the company I worked and still work for and with, what we we tend to think long long term. Yeah, it means at the in the interest of the customer. So and that keeps the revenues flow because with that you gain their trust and you keep their trust. Mm-hmm. And with that, they come to you when it comes for the integration aspect as well. Thrive thrive after go live as my departed brother, Michael Doan always said, you know, keep, keep the customer thriving and 
yeah. and and the right. and the revenues flow in a in a proper manner, yeah. not in a irresponsible manner. Yeah, yeah. So um, go go in and start selling them blockchain, and and it's not going to work out so good. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's when I started this this episode here. So I heard you yeah. ranting about blockchain. Thought huh? I was oh, yes, I was. <laughs> Well, because I got pointed to this trends in, in manufacturing thing, and they were like, oh, you got to check out blockchain. And I went to the PWC website, and they couldn't demonstrate a single live project. And so I was like, well, you know, here we are in the circus again. There may be applications for blockchain other than Bitcoin. But, well, I'm a CRM type of guy, you know, so there I haven't seen them. Well, there's this concept of smart contracts, which may or may not fly, but that's it. There have been plenty of ideas in marketing, which all well tanked, I guess, so far. Mm. Yeah, so, well, blockchain made me stay here. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, it worked for that reason yeah. then, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The B word. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. it, it keeps Dennis says, uh, "Oh, John managed the B word." Yeah, it keeps it keeps freaking coming up. I can't keep it out of my friggin' inbox. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a question, LinkedIn user. How do you guys deal with NDAs and sharing the thoughts that happen off the back of that investment that can help us all? I mean, um, there's different kind of forms of in NDAs in our in our industry, but very frequently in our line of work. Uh, through the analyst track at events, we are asked to participate in NDA sessions. I, I personally won't sign an NDA period uh, for a variety of reasons. So if it's if I'm required to sign, I won't attend an event. I'm very hardcore about that, but I will agree to uh, so-called gentle persons NDAs. Uh, uh, but I, I will admit that I find them frustrating because I would say that 95% of what vendors consider NDA material is absolutely not it's not NDA and it doesn't warrant the label and it's BS. Um, and, and it essentially just ends up muzzling the information that customers deserve to hear. So I find that very frustrating, um, but I will agree to it, uh, especially if it's a short term and it will lift quickly. Um, but you know, these kinds of video shows are part of my goal in this is to bring that stuff out. I mean, obviously we can't sit here right now and share NDA related content, but um, there's a lot we can share, and and I believe we have an obligation to share it. I mean, that's when you talk about successful projects, like every every if to get more projects across the finish line, every single one of us has to do a better job, and that includes sharing what piece of intellectual property we have, in my opinion, as much as we can. So that's that's my view on it. I uh, I would echo your sentiments. I hate to see those NDA things show up. Um, and I'd like to think that over the years, I haven't violated a one of them yet. And um, and I would think that a vendor would learn that I am trustworthy and that they could deal with me on that level. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I mean, I understand they have a, they want to protect their intellectual property. I get it. Um, I will tell you though, that uh, things that just rank me and upset vendors is, I started one just in, about a month and a half ago. And what was fascinating is I go, you know what, before we even get in the call, let me guess what you're going to tell me. And I went through and outlined pretty much every bullet point they were going to talk about. And they were just gobsmacked to use Dennis's one of his favorite words that I already knew all this stuff and that it wasn't a surprise. And then they go, in, in their dumbfounded way, they're like, how did you know that? Because they were really thinking that I must have had some mole or something in their company. And I go, well, I knew all that because that's what every one of your competitors is doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I figured you had to, you know, why are you going to be any different? And in fact, more importantly, most of your competitors have been doing this stuff for two or three years. So let's get on with the program. So are you going to tell me something new that I don't already know? And that was about the end of that call. Uh, you know, I already knew it all anyway. Uh, most of these folks are astonished to find out that what they thought was a new and revolutionary idea is anything but. And like we had one, and I know Dennis and John can guess who this is, but we had a vendor the other day who was all wound up about their multi-tenancy capability. Now, mind you, we've only been talking about multi-tenancies, what, 1997 and 99, that was 
Plex and uh, Salesforce.com. And, you know, to have to ask me to do an NDA over a discussion on multi-tenancy in 2020, that's like asking, uh, that's like, that's like asking uh, a big three automaker to sign an NDA over the horse drawn cart. I mean, you know, it's like, come on guys, you know, let's get in the right century here with some of this kind of stuff. Come on. The horse drawn cart is a clean energy source. Yeah. Um, it's good. So, yeah. Well, well, it runs well, on totally well, renewable well, energy. Cows are contributing significantly to climate change. There you go. Yeah, so there, there's lots of methane. That's yeah, there is there is a methane. Up. There's a methane component, but I believe yeah. that problem can be solved, Thomas. Yeah. But yeah. Um, all right. So, what is your take on NDAs? And well, there are NDAs and NDAs. So, what, from an analyst analyst point of view, well, they ask me to for an embargo, yeah, which I well, I if I need to write it, I anyways need a few days yeah, because I'm. Yeah, so and that's and that's what Dan said that's, here. He says fine, he won't yeah. sign NDAs. So he says, says he'll hold back on embargoed yeah. information. Happy yeah. to honor that. Yeah. Then there are other things. I'm also acting as an advisor. Yeah. So if I'm if if I'm advising a startup, I'm well there. I'm rather willing to sign a fair NDA. Yeah. Right. Kind of a muzzling agreement, but that's okay. Yeah. What. I echo Brian's sentiment there that at the end of the day, it's about trust. Well, if they don't trust me, then they could stay away. But on the other hand, I also need to earn the trust, but because m many a times they don't really know me. So well, I, I kind of look at it this way, almost mathematically. If they want to do a, a an NDA with just me and me only, then it's usually they want to they want to share some super deep, dark internal thing with me and get my feedback on it. I can agree to that because because it's probably going to be a very interesting and novel kind of thing. But if they're going to ask 50 of my analyst peers to sign the same NDA, then I guarantee you it's commodity stuff that they're going to talk about. We already some of us already know about it, you know, so what's the point, you know, so right. that's what, what what they usually all do, right? So they ask us to embargo it for a while and that's it. Yeah. And I said, I need some time anyways to write it. I mean, one of my, one of my all time, one of my all time favorites, I agreed to an NDA on with the vendor on, on a pretty sensitive topic. Um, but they sat on it for a long time and wouldn't lift it. And in the meantime, a, a, an, an enterprising journalist, the kind that no longer exists in our industry, uh, found, found out about it and, and wrote up the story, um, but, but didn't understand the context. And so then they got a, a story that was, that was crap and sensational when they could have gotten a much more nuanced piece of coverage. And it just reminded me of, like, like we discussed, uh, where was the trust? You know, I could have done a responsible version of the story. You sat on it someone else discovered it and it became a sensational story and you lost control of it completely, mm. you know? So, um, you know, I think, I think it, it requires vendors need to back off, but I think Thomas, your example of working on a project where you sign an NDA working with this, that's a very different example. That's yeah. not really the analyst NDA is a different oh, story. Analyst, uh, <laughs> that's a, from an analyst point of view, I'm yet to sign one. So I actually wasn't asked for one. Well, you will. It'll happen. Well, <laughs> it'll happen no, someday. I'm tiny someday. little <laughs> someday. When 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 the when the blockchain platform is ready, it will it will happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a blockchain platform I actually signed an NDA for, but that's on the startup advisory portion. <laughs> and well, I actually had to block a, block a user. This is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah doesn't happen that often so that's shows we're we're really getting visibility guys getting track um yeah. yeah um but i am gonna have to wrap in a sec because uh well frankly my my butt's sore um so <laughs> I mean, 
I've been is, sitting. Is that I've been sub- sitting for like ninety minutes now. So is, is, is that, that a subtle way? <laughs> is that a subtle way asking Santa for a special <laughs> gift for you this year for Christmas? Yeah, man, I might need like a a, a video talk show cushion for these shows because they've been kind of going on. But that was kind of my my goal anyway was to have these more um, informal things that was more like talk radio. So. Um, guys, did we miss anything you wanted to get out there on the topic of of achieving a few more successful projects in this world? Did we miss anything? Be clear uh, about the problem you solve and think about it first, not after. I'm going to say, don't believe anybody who says the project's 85% complete. I, I, I was on one, uh, I was brought in to look at a project that had been 85% complete for three straight years. And mm-hmm. uh, and when I got through looking at it, I figured they were maybe a third of the way through. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, watch out. Mm-hmm. Who, who asks there whether Bill McDermott is the SAP CEO? He is, is not for a year about. Uh, no, no, that... We won't do a, a history of SAP, but I would direct you to Diginomica, where you can find plenty of coverage on that topic, including some very juicy articles yes. uh, by, by Den Hallett on this chat, so I think you will enjoy. Or just, um, or just the corporate pages of SAP. They show yeah, I, I'm not going to yeah, I'm not going to direct you there, but yes, the corporate page at SAP would also clarify that for you. But if you want some context, uh, you don't have to sign an NDA to go to Diginomica, so that, that would be great. Um, Den points out that I need to ask support. I just said that I did. This is not a secret. This is not a secret. Look. Look. My butt hurts, all right? Come on. <laughs> oh, but it needed to be made next week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got a good shout out for Dennis here. Yeah. He's the guy I used to idolize. He would give me confidence to talk loudly to management and make things better. Bingo. Mm-hmm. Uh, somewhere Dennis Hallett is smiling because if there's one thing Dennis Hallett wants you all to do in this world, it's talk more loudly to management. I can guarantee you that. So I, th- I thought the Dennis Hallett lesson was uh, that he taught us all to wear Hawaiian shirts to every executive uh, meeting or briefing or whatever, but uh, okay. Yep, and he taught us to uh, suck less every day. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there's a few more that we can't say on a public airing kind of thing here, but yeah, he's got some great ones. Um, um, I, yep. I don't know that I'll, I'm at my age that I, I'm going to even try to aspire to some of Dennis's levels, uh, but uh, I, I get close, I think, some days when a vendor really gets me rankled. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, Guys, I appreciate you hopping on. Uh, I don't think I would have maintained this for 90 minutes by myself, so uh, uh, that was fun. Uh, thanks for the spontaneity. That I think we need a lot more of that in our world. Um, and thanks for the readers and, your, and the audience in your lively discussion. And I'll be back in the new year with more unpredictable enterprise drama. So, guys, have a great holiday. Catch you on the other side. Make the most yep. of your time here. Bye. Later.